All righty. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second event in Waging Dialogues Meta Dialogue series. This series is all about looking for patterns in communication, seeing what effective methods we can apply to future bridging efforts. Today, we will be looking at a conversation between Waging Dialogues founder, Dr. Alice L. Mayer, and Bobby Powell, host of The Truth is Viral, which is an internet and radio program out of Michigan. Bobby and Alice met on Facebook in Alice's regular discussion group. This is a sort of informal long-term project where she posts a daily prompt on Facebook and people respond to it. It's been going on for several years now. People come and go, it's often very heated. So Bobby made a big splash in this group. <clears throat> Excuse me, Bobby. <clears throat> Bobby made a big splash in this group. He has some controversial opinions. He's had intense confrontations with some people, gotten other people fired up in support, but he and Alice have formed a particularly strong rapport over time. And that's what brings us here today. So we're going to try and apply our meta dialogue analysis to a conversation between Alice and Bobby that took place a year ago. Each of our panelists will be leading a discussion on a particular clip from that conversation. And Dr. Mayer is here as well to answer questions and try to provide context. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to her to introduce herself and say a little bit about Wage Dialogue, about her goals with this project, uh, and then I'll have each of our panelists introduce themselves. Um, thank you all for um, joining this, um, this discussion. Um, I, when Bobby and I met, um, we decided to do this dialogue um, as a way of just experimenting to see if it's possible for people with dramatically different worldviews, political views, to come together and actually get to know each other and have a conversation. Um, I set it up in a particular way. Um, Bobby was trained as a journalist. He hosts his own uh, radio program and he values his identity as a journalist. I value my identity as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. So I wanted to set it up as the journalist and the psychiatrist coming together in conversation, not one interviewing the other, but I, I was, my fantasy was that at the end of it, it would be something that he could show his friends and be proud of, and I could show my friends and be proud of. And I was very pleased that that happened. In fact, um, months later, um, there was a time when we had the exact number of views on both of our YouTube channels. And that, I, I, that pleased me enormously. And the other thing I wanted to do was to make it intriguing because when we have our entrenched identities, we own them, we like them, we can't change them, we don't want to change them. If you give people books, statistics, or research, their eyes are going to glaze over. Um, and, but there's something about this kind of, of adventure that is both intellectual, it's dynamic, and it's an adventure. It's, it's a drama. And, and, and I, um, I meant it to be that way so that it would intrigue people. And the fact that you're here pleases me enormously. Um, anyway, that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're going to introduce our panelists. Um, and I'll just go clockwise on my screen. Uh, so Sue, you wanna give us an introduction? Hi, I'm Sue Colod. I'm a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst, and I am a supervising and training analyst at my institute, the William Allenson White Institute, and I'm on the board and the executive committee of the International Psychoanalytic Association. I wanted to say just a few words about how this group came together here. Uh, Chris Heath and I were uh, talking after we'd been to a number of psychoanalytic conferences about the fact that a theme kept coming up that psychoanalysis had much to offer about damaging polarization, but we weren't hearing much from our colleagues about what we could actually do to alleviate this. Uh, then um, we formed a little group with Alice 
and Matt and Chris and Lori and two younger people who are both super smart and very passionate about their worldviews. And we've been reviewing literature about polarization. We've been reading people like Cass Sunstein, some people from Braver Angels. And it was kind of a discussion group. And then on January 6th, Alice posted this video that she did with Bobby on the listserv of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And there was a firestorm that occurred because of that. People were saying it was dangerous what Alice was doing, that she was being duped, that she was being used. And our little group was really shocked by that. So we watched the video and we had a dialogue about it. And then Matt and Alice asked us to join this group today. Mm -hmm. so I'm I'm uh, I'm very really pleased to be here, and I'm looking forward to hearing about people's reactions to the video. All right, uh, Kirk. Yes, I'm Kirk Schneider. I'm a psychologist. Uh, my orientation is depth existential humanistic psychology, and I have some background in psychoanalysis as well. And uh, I'm I'm very pleased to be uh, with you all. Uh, I, I have been uh, promoting and uh, initiating webinars in, in an approach that I call the Experiential Democracy Dialogue, which is uh, a hybrid of my work in that area for many years and my work as a trained moderator for Braver Angels. And it's a one-on-one -on -one format with people of very contrasting backgrounds. And so uh, part of my intrigue with all of this is how the experiential democracy dialogue may dovetail with, compare, contrast with Alice's work here. And I've already been very uh, energized by the, uh, the parallels and perhaps some, some differences as well. And uh, also, I'm uh, running for uh, president. I've been nominated to be a candidate for president of the American Psychological Association. And one of my chief platforms is uh, the focus on uh, what I call emotionally restorative relationships. And I see these healing social dialogues as very integral to that. And I think psychologists, analysts, uh, people in our profession are particularly uh, suited to go out into the country right now and uh, help to facilitate these kinds of dialogues. That's something I'm going to promote heavily. So I'm, I'm energized by all that's happening here. All right, Chris. Chris Heath, I'm a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist. Um, I'm a chair of external uh, communication for the International Psychoanalytical Association. I'm, I'm very interested in how we see other people that uh, I, I think we all have prejudices and um, things we dislike, things we don't trust automatically about uh, other people. And, and, and most of that, maybe all of that is because of our own kind of limitations of what we can accept within ourselves. But we, uh, we take what we hate the most and even what we adore the most about ourselves and, and like project it. We uh, see the other person through these lenses. And so the more we can own ourselves and see the other person as a rich individual, I think the better off we'll all be. Uh, and which is what draws me to this group. Uh, I'm, I'm on social media. I'm on what? TikTok, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, A Chris Heath MD. Laurie? Uh, I'm Lori Ammon, and I'm a psychotherapist and a psychoanalyst, and I've just had the benefit, as you all can hear, of being in the midst of some uh, thought leaders in the mental health profession. And so uh, why am I here? I think I just was invited and I stay in this discussion because I just hope that uh, the passion that each one of these leaders has, that I'll catch that virus and, and spread it. <laughs> All right, um, so we're going to start uh, with, Chris is going to present a clip and then we will discuss that clip. 
This is from the discussion conversation between Alice and Bobby. And uh, Chris, is there anything you want to say before I go ahead with this? Yeah, just briefly. I'm I'm impressed by the whole conversation, and 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 uh, viewers ought to look uh, at the whole video after we're done because mm -hmm. it kind of uh, we may put your view of it into context or open your mind to new views. Uh, but but I've chose this clip in particular. It's a really good example of of uh, Alice and Bobby working really hard to see the other person. Like uh, it's clear at times they they have a, a differing views, sometimes opposing views. Uh, 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 it, there there's uh, uh, moments of tension, but uh, uh, but each it it's funny because each seem to be heard by the other. And when that happens, there's a calmness. Uh, it, it there's this moment uh, that uh, it, there's this tension, and they kind of partly agree to disagree, and mostly agree to see the other person as as a rich individual. And and Alice says, "Watch for this." Alice says, "What we're saying isn't mutually exclusive," and and I think it be uh, beautifully puts together, uh, you know, the the moment between them. So, uh, and, and I'll have a few more words after the clip, and we can begin discussing. But yeah, if you could go ahead and show it. I will go ahead and do that. It's a matter of honor. It's a matter of integrity. Okay? It doesn't have anything to do with hard surroundings. But yeah, but um, I think that's true of black, white, green people. Well, sure um, it is. Everybody, you know, is a, everybody is afflicted with the, the, the problem of being lazy. And it's not a, a racial issue. It, it's not a, a, a economical social issue because poor people can be honest. That's true. And, and rich people can be lazy. and They and sure can. And they steal. Okay. It, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a personal, it's an issue of personal integrity. Okay. And that's something that uh, because, you know, we've got to work on. Issue. For example, the reason I'm a doctor is because I came in on the feminist wave. Um, the year I started um, at medical school, they went from 10% um, women to 33% women. And I got in, and that 33%, I probably would not have gotten in on, on the 10%. Um, and, you know, before that, I was, you know, going to be a, a housewife or a nurse or a secretary or a nun or, a, you know, a, a mother or what, what, one of those things. Um, but then I got into college and it was like, wow, I can be a doctor. Um, I'd like to see that happen with people who have been sort of not allowed in, um, you know, for the same reasons. Um, black people, uh, people of other, you know, we can transition to gender, sexuality, other kinds of, of, um, of ways that we look down on them. I would like to have an opportunity for them to, that doesn't mean you have to have the drive, you have to have the intelligence, the ability in order to get through medical school, but you also have to have somebody say, hey, you know, let's take more of these people because these people can do it just as much as other people can do it. Okay, well, what's wrong with a merit-based system? Take the people with the highest test scores, no matter what their skin color, no matter what their religion, no matter how they identify sexually. How about we just go to a merit-based system on everything. I like that idea. With, with tweaks, because I know a whole lot of people. I mean, I, I work with a, lot, a very complex group of people who have different kinds of psychological dynamics, and sometimes they need a little help. Um, it, it's, it's not all merit-based when, when some of the forces, internal forces, external forces are against them, and sometimes a little bit of help. Um, can, can help them, you know, leave a cycle of, of just sort of being stuck where their families were stuck and they were stuck. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, th I think a lot of what we're saying is not mutually exclusive. It, it gets, um, our political system forces us there very quickly. Um, you, you know, I, I, racism, I, I despise ism words. I, I, my, my friends will tell you that. They, they, they laugh at me when I say that. Um, because they're so divisive so quickly. You're racist, you're sexist, or, or, or you know, you're homophobia, you're Islam Islamophobic. Um, as soon as you say that, you're instantly on my side or against me. These are really nuanced ideas. Well, you know, 
think about the word, the, the suffix phobic. Okay, that's what I said at the beginning of this conversation. It, it's all about fear and uh -huh. ignorance. Okay, people don't educate themselves. Okay, and, you know, that's a problem. People, you know, from a, a news person's perspective, people read the headlines and they make a decision based on that. Let me tell you something. Headlines are written by interns and they take the, the most sensational fact that they can find and, and use that as their headline. Okay, so, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, there's kind of a rule that the, that the truth of a story, if it's in there at all, is buried somewhere beneath the 16th paragraph. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people in today's busy world where you have to have uh, a parent or two parents working two jobs apiece just to, to make a living, you know, people don't have time to read the, the, the head below the headlines they, they were, or even the subheads, you know, and, and, and the fact that, you know, what really happened that was buried deep in the story contradicts the headline. They, they don't know that and they don't remember that. And, and that's a problem. So as a 30 year veteran of the news business, let me tell you, it sucks. These people are liars. The, the, all the all all the television stations that you watch, all of the radio stations that you listen to, all of the newspapers that you read, are owned by six corporations. There is no diversity of thought. So, so we all can right. see how. May I? Should yeah, I just go, go ahead? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, this 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 rise and and lowering of of tension or. Uh, um, I mean, I can perceive, I, I think most people watching this video can perceive a, a rise and lowering of tension. And, and early on, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of tension and kind of uh, uh, disagreement and, and it resolved. And it started building again towards the end. But, uh, I, uh, it, you know, how do we, uh, I, I think one of the things that psychoanalysts uh, are especially kind of trained at, but I think it lives in, in anyone, uh, is the, uh, the perception of, of when we're stirred up when we're activated and and what do we do with that? Because uh, it comes from within ourselves because we're talking about a touchy subject. Uh, it, it often comes from the other person because they're stirred up and, and they sometimes we wanna share the uh, stirred upness. Uh, but uh, but how to, to how to take that and kind of metabolize that? How to, uh, how to uh, uh, hear it and do something different with it? A corollary to this, I think, is the movement uh, 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 it, this is a controversial idea. I'm, I'm a bit anxious in even bringing it up, but but you know the uh, tr uh, the, the uh, trend towards uh, being an anti-racist. Uh, when you see prejudice, we're supposed to, according to some people, kind of call it out. Uh, and 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 there's some there's truth to that. But at the same time, uh, might we not have to call it out every time? Uh, uh, yeah, take a stand uh, for what you feel is right. And at the same time, hear the other person and, and where are they coming from? Uh, what's, uh, what's, what's kind of motivating them to say what they're saying? Uh, and, and if there's some agitation that comes with that, what's that telling us? Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the, the kind of things I, I took from, from the beauty of the of the dialogue there. What are y'all's thoughts about the, the clip and all that? Hey, Sue? Well, I'm going to take on the role of being the skeptic. I think we have to have a, a skeptic if we're going to have a dialogue, okay? Uh, there, I've watched the video now five times, and there's no question in my mind that something really valuable is going on. The two of you, Alice, you and Bobby, have formed this bond, and that is undeniable. However, I would, I would question whether I would call this a dialogue. I, it was more like an interview. So um, the, Chris chose a clip where, it where we jumped right in, in the middle and you're actually both talking. But the first, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, it's just Bobby talking and Alice is listening and she's a very good listener and occasionally she asks a question. Um, so what I would like to, I would see this more as like a pre-dialogue. What I would really like to see is that the next time that you and Bobby talk, can you really engage more fully in some of the profound differences the two of you have in your worldview? Because I think in a lot of ways, um, uh, in this interview, those got smoothed over quite a bit. The other thing I just wanted to say briefly is uh, Bobby's facts. 
Bobby's facts are different from my facts. And I facts, fact checked a number of things that he said. Um, this got cut off, but he talked about uh, farmers being murdered in South Africa. And I, you know, I did my research and it said that this, this was an unsubstantiated claim um, that uh, was a key element of white genocide conspiracy theories and has become a common talking point among white nationalists worldwide. So, you know, can you two actually get into that? Because, you know, what he calls facts, I call conspiracy theories. Well, would it have helped for me to question that in, in this particular setting? I'm, I'm just curious what you think. I chose not to, to question um, specific facts. I, I, it just, I, I wanted to hear the music. I wanted to I hear the music. I don't know whether it would help. I doubt that the two of you would have formed the bond if you'd gone right into that. But I think maybe now that you have the bond, maybe you could question him a little bit more about some of his assertions. That's what I would hope for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I can see very much uh, what um, uh, Sue, Sue is talking about here. I, I view this to a large degree through the lens of process versus content or process in distinction from content. And that's what I was most impressed with with, with Alice was uh, that your process enabled Bobby to uh, feel more free mm -hmm. to speak honestly and to speak with some passion as well. And, um, and I think it also allowed you to both begin to address some of the actual policy issues that were involved. I noticed, Alice, that you talked about appreciating his view on affirmative action, but uh, wanting to tweak it. So, and that seemed to me a, a good beginning of a, a further conversation about how you might tweak it and how he would perceive that, that tweak. Because it sounds like your tweak would combine uh, your concern with supporting diverse people um, and possibly with his concern about um, supporting people of merit, you know, for certain positions. It did seem like there was, you know, a, a possibility for some common ground there. Uh, but again, I think the process between you two helps to lay the groundwork for the likelihood of common ground. But perhaps even more important to that, and I think to your point, Alice, about uh, you know the problem with being overly identified with facts, is that just enabling two people of such contrasting backgrounds to sit with one another and to be present in, a rel in relative safety, it's to me an enormous step. You know, toward what we want to build as a, a society, if if we want to be a sustainable and ultimately flourishing society, you know, where we're actually learning from each other and being more enriched by each other, but a, a major first step is just being able to sit with one another. We're all in so many silos; we're not doing that now. So, those are some of my thoughts about. It. Um, so, I'd, I'd like to comment on, kind of on a different level, and that is. Um, in identifying with Bobby coming from the same uh, seabed of neoliberal thinking, um, which, which divides us and has us focused on our own self-interest, right? It's, it's about my tribe and protecting my tribe. And, and Bobby comes into this dialogue with Alice, uh, evidently getting pretty beat up by uh, people uh, judging him, class, you know, classifying him as, as a, a racist. And so the beauty that I enjoyed through this, uh, watching these videos is how Alice, you, you rise above a discussion of right doing or wrongdoing to meet him. 
and that's instructive to, to, to any viewer, right? Of, of how are we going to meet another person at that level of humanity? How are we going to hear them? It isn't our debates on what's right, what's wrong, who's right, who's wrong, is it? Yeah, that, I think that's what I was trying to do was just to meet one human being to another, um, which is you know a good philosophy that I can sell. But the other part of it is that he's been doing this loudly, you know, weekly for a very long time. He's got his research. Um, he knows more than I do about this stuff. And I don't know what's accurate and what's not accurate when he says 20% of this and 40% of that, and this person did this and that person did that. I, I'm, I will look stupid if I try to argue with that. <laughs> um, so that was another reason why I, I let a lot of that go. He's smart. Mm -hmm. and, but, but, yeah, and, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, what, what do we do when uh, someone uh, has uh, so-called facts that are so abhorrent, I mean, uh, that we can't tolerate it? I mean, yeah, these, uh, 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 Sue had to search a little bit to, to get the background on, on these facts. Now, what if he was saying it's, it's okay to do some horrible, awful act, and, uh, and he's justifying it in some way, uh, and, and, and maybe planning on doing it? soon. Now, that's not Bobby. We see in later videos or clips that, uh, that Bobby basically uh, has good intentions and is just coming from a very different place than Alice. But, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but that may be part of where I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, where do we uh, uh, have a line for ourselves uh, between uh, anti-racism uh, uh, and um, uh, tolerance for the other point of view. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, Sue makes a really important uh, point that I don't think I have an answer for. Uh, you know, what do we do when, when facts are thrown out that we really can't tolerate in the room? Sue? Well, you know, Alice, you've said in some ways that this is like a therapy session. So if a patient said something you wouldn't fact check it. That's not the kind of thing you would do. You would just listen. You would want to get the idea of what they're getting at. Um, but I'm, I'm actually ambitious for the two of you. I want you to be able to do more. I want you to be able to actually grapple with and disagree with each other about things you truly don't agree about. And you know, I, I'm curious to hear from Kirk also, Kirk also, because you do this regularly and I don't, and maybe that doesn't work, but I, I, that's what I would hope for. Well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I think that the problem is that these kinds of conversations devolve so quickly. They, de they devolve into verbal flame throwing or, or avoidance of issues uh, or violence. And, and it's just, it's extremely striking how quickly they can develop. And that's because, that's because I, I do believe that psychodynamically, there's a primal terror that is fueling a lot of the reactivity in these kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. Terror around the sense of, of insignificance, the sense of not mattering in some way. You could say a form of death anxiety behind this. So that's where I think we do need to be quite delicate in terms of our approach to these kind of dialogues. And that's why uh, we have emphasized uh, a highly structured format uh, because that seems to help create more sense of safety. And that structure is anchored in very strict ground rules. Um, ground rules that are about, you know, coming from a place of, of genuine curiosity, of, of respect to the degree possible, at least respecting the fact that that other person's willing to sit with you and be present, uh, and of avoiding, you know, nonverbal cues that are, are degrading, etc., you know, heavy sighs or whatever. Now, I think that Alice does this organically. And she doesn't seem to, I'll be curious to hear more, but she doesn't seem to follow a particular structure or format, except that you've sort of organically set the tone for a humane and respectful meeting, kind of I thou meeting. And, and so- uh, I thou meeting, can you say a bit more about that, what you mean? 
well, deriving from Buber's philosophy of being able to acknowledge the individuality of that person while at the same time being able to meet them in some way and um, meet them with your own individuality. So uh, it's, it's a kind of a paradoxical mode of respect both for self and other. I agree that uh, Alice does that well. I mean, uh, that's how uh, it seems like uh, they, uh, she and, and to some degree, Bobby, uh, agree to have that, ag agree to, uh, um, partly because they've built something of a relationship beforehand, uh, and, and they both want to create a platform where they're both heard. It seems like they're both, uh, their subjectivity is, is uh, respected. Yeah, I think that's true. But I also think that we do have a lot of forums for debate and you know, debating facts and so on. And we see this in social media and in the big media. And, and where does it go? <laughs> it seems to me that it often does devolve into, uh, you know, a lot of, yeah, just. Yeah. I think people you. are desperate to be listened to, just, just to be heard. And arguing facts seems like it, takes away from that to some extent. It's, you know, let's see who's right about this. And they um, scream louder and louder and no one gets yeah. heard in the maelstrom. Yeah. Right. yeah. And it gets worse and worse. Mm. Um, right. uh, final thought, anybody? I just, I guess I wonder whether just listening to the other person is enough. I would like more grappling. And maybe further, yeah. Further dialogues of this kind would lead to that. Yes, that's what, that's what I hope. I would hope so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, before I go on to the next clip, I just want to say that there will be a Q and A at the end. I forgot to mention that, uh, and that's going to be using the Q and A feature at the bottom of the screen. Technically, you can do that at any time, uh, but I would suggest holding off to the end. I'm not going to read them till the end. Uh, and your questions and might get answered in the meantime. So uh, I'm going to move on next to uh, Kirk. Okay. So in this clip, I was struck by a couple of points, and I think there are major points. One was uh, Bobby talking about the death of his wife and the struggle that she had with cancer and how that uh, how that affected his view of government support of people who aren't aren't even citizens of the country whereas his wife was not able to get uh, the, the funding apparently that she needed to be treated properly for his, her cancer. And, um, and he also talks later in the interview about the death of his daughter, but it brings up the point of trauma for me and how much trauma uh, seems to impact one's polarization, what I might call polarized mind, you know, fixation on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. And anyway, I'll talk about this more after the, the video, but uh, ACEs or adverse childhood events also seem to be associated with extremist political religious views. Uh, and the second point was uh, Bobby's acknowledgement of Alice uh, providing that, that sacred space, that supportive space that I was talking about before and allowing him to get his words in edgewise. Those are the two things that struck me and they're very important to these conversations. All right. My wife worked two and three jobs at a time for 35 years. And she got cancer in, in, in 2012 and, and died in 2015. Now, in 2015, in Michigan alone, $1 billion with a B 
was spent on illegal aliens to provide them with subsidized housing, with quote unquote free healthcare, and even free college for these so called dreamers. Okay. Now, we applied for Obamacare's hospice program that would have you know, brought in skilled medical care to, to attend to my wife in her last days. We were denied because the Obamacare program that paid for hospice was broke. Okay, so my wife died screaming so that an illegal alien could get a free quarter credit of a college hour. You know, tell me, how is that fair? To my wife, who worked her entire life, paid into the system with every check. And how is it fair to the other uncounted American citizens who were also denied benefits that they had worked and slaved for their entire lives so that we could provide uh, all this stuff for people whose first act in the United States was to commit a crime? You know, illegal aliens, they say illegal aliens pay taxes. Sure, they pay sales taxes. Okay, they do not pay income taxes. They can't. They're undocumented. If they pay, if they're forced by their job to have a social security number or an EITN number, it's been stolen. So that's another crime that they are committing. Okay, these people don't have any respect for our rule of law. I'm sorry that somebody has was brought here as a child and uh, has lived here all of their life. And now that they're in college, Okay, their uh, citizenship status is in question. I'm sorry about that. You've had 20 years to resolve that. Don't I, put it on yeah. me. Don't put it on my family. Don't put it on my wife. But okay, yeah, you, that was unfair. But, that was totally unsatisfactory. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Do you. But don't you think that it's possible for people like us um, to get together and figure out ways to reform both the immigration system and the healthcare system. We spend well, so much energy attacking each other. Yes, it's possible, but nobody wants to. You know, that's why I'm so eager for this conversation to, and to talk well, with you, Alice, because you let me get damn word in edgewise and you let me say, and you let me say my mind. Okay, and, and I don't have any hatred for anybody, but we've got to have some common sense. We have a limited amount no, of money. No, no. We have, and, and we just can't give it to everybody. We can't send a billion dollars to Pakistan so that the, their transgender folks can figure out which bathroom to use. Okay, we're drowning. We're, we're in a lifeboat and we can't keep on giving and giving and, and pulling people in or everybody's going to drown. Nobody realizes this. We're now $30 trillion in debt. Okay, so again, the, the themes of context and process. Now, I, I think what uh, Alice was facilitating here was a chance for Bobby to, again, more fully express himself. And what Bobby was expressing was a lot about where he was coming from. And that's so important in these kind of dialogues is, is not to actually jump right into the actual uh, discussion of a given issue. And, and that's, we don't do that in the experiential democracy format. In fact, we begin with a visualization. What would it be? What do you visualize would be like sitting with this other person with their extreme difference? The thoughts, feelings, sensations that come through without fixating on any one of those. And then can you see this person as a more as a human being. And then even a uh, second phase is a background phase. What was it like for them to grow up, especially in the context of the issue at hand? So we're finding out more about the context that Bobby is coming from. And that explains, in my view, a good deal of his anger, his bitterness. It's primal, it's very deep. And actually, I wanted to mention quickly a study, an interesting study uh, a Welsh group did on anti-vaxxers and anti-mask people, where they found that uh, those who had experienced 
I believe it was three or four adverse childhood event, events, traumas, uh, tended to be much more extreme in terms of anti-vaxxing and anti-mask wearing than the other group. Uh, I, I think this is a generalizable finding, not just to the so-called right wing, I think to the left wing as well. Polarized mind knows no party affiliation particularly, but it's that fear that pushes people into these, you know, hardened and absolutist positions. And I think Bobby was illustrating that. And then the second point about process. Uh, yeah, you could look at this in terms of words exchanged and it's in some ways, you know, horrifying in terms of the gap that you two may have at a content level. But I think what Bobby was sensing was just what we were talking about or Sue was talking about before, the powerful bond that you formed with each other. And that was really coming through to him and he was appreciative of that. And I think that tempered actually what would have been a greater explosion. You know, yes and no, because I found myself thrown off by the fact that a lot of what he said made more sense to me than I was expecting. You know, you right. hear the, you know, my friends on the left with, with a nearly unanimous voice that they're anti-immigrant, they're white mm -hmm. supremacists, they're anti-health insurance. So there's a prejudice that comes from that. And when you hear his story and his yeah. explanation for why he feels the way he does, it like makes sense. Yeah, I agree with that. I felt yeah. that too. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so, so. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be my skeptic self here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, this the context of this was talking about illegal aliens and how they're getting everything and his wife gets nothing. Uh, it's a horrible story. It's so sad about his wife not being able to have hospice care. I felt terrible for him. I felt so much sympathy for him. But having watched the video uh, many times, he uses personal stories in a, in a highly uh, dramatic manner to make his point. So it feels a slightly, to me, it feels slightly um, manipulative that the way he tells personal stories. And um, I would, again, I wouldn't do this with a patient, but with him, I would want more details about why he wasn't, why they weren't able to get hospice care, why, how Obamacare ran out of money. I would want to understand that better. I wouldn't just mm -hmm. take it at face value. I would be asking about that. And to go on, uh, and also, um, how did illegal aliens cause his wife not to have hospice care? I just don't get what the connection is there. Um, you know, he says that the aliens are lawbreakers and the dreamers had 20 years to resolve their conflict. Don't put it on my wife. But what does it have to do with his wife? And how is one related to the other? And, and I just want to end by something I thought was kind of ironic, which was he, he so much appreciates that you let him get a word in edgewise, but I felt he wasn't letting you get a word in edgewise. I agree with everything Sue said, and at the same time, I uh, want to keep paying attention to the the, the process, uh, the uh, the uh, interchange of feelings, and what uh, is kind of going on on an emotional level. Uh, you know, we we all live with a kind of an unconscious fantasy that really drives us, and 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 under the surface, if you portray, uh, if if you were to write a script of what's going on here, uh, I, I think Bobby is being very provocative. Uh, uh, he's provoked. Uh, he is. Uh, and I think human beings, whether he's being purposefully manipulative or if he has so much affect that he's just having to pass it off to the other person, uh, he's dumping some stuff out into the room that Alice is containing, basically. I, you know, I can imagine being in Alice's shoes and uh, kind of riding this uh, emotional roller coaster. And, and, and I, you know, we do this for a living. And, and so uh, it, it, I know firsthand that it, it, it can be very kind of um, uh, uh, what word to put to it. Sometimes words escape us with this kind of thing. Uh, chaotic would be a mild way to put it. Uh, and, uh, and, and how does, uh, and, and so I think Alice just holding onto her chair and responding with 
And you know what she responds to with all that is, you know, people like us, uh, uh, and she says something else and, and tries to tie them, connect them. Yeah, hey, we're in this together. All right, we're both human beings, whatever happened. And, uh, and, and they, they're able to kind of rescue the, the dialogue. It, it's, it's really kind of incredible. Yeah, my other question for you, Alice, and this is an ongoing question, is, is your approach transferable to others so that we can create, you know, a, a sort of, uh, well, a spreading of, of this type of meeting with people? That, that's where something like the Braver Angels or Experiential Democracy Dialogue may be helpful because they have their structure. They keep people in guardrails. And um, I just don't know if many people can replicate what you can do. <laughs> I'd like to come up with some kind of, of um, if not a recipe, then an outline of how one might approach it and just have some people try, try it on for size um, yeah. and see what happens. And then we can do some, you know, case histories, is, is YouTube, um, events that we can watch or do some statistics, um, see what works and what doesn't. Um, people can try it in, in all different arenas. I, I'd like to get people intrigued enough just to see what happens because it, and, and different things can happen. One group would might thoroughly enjoy throwing statistics at each other and another might enjoy um, just sharing personal stories and how they came to be who they are. Um, and all of those are valid. Um, and if anyone can, yeah. if anyone can do it, I, I think it's hopefully it's people like us who have been trained in these approaches and to tolerate uh, a, a wide range of anxiety. To be able to contain opposing and even contradictory yeah. points of view yeah. at the same time. Yes, yes. And to ask questions from, like you were talking about asking a question, I, I very much think that could and should be a part of it. But to ask the question from a place of genuine curiosity versus some kind of presumption or agenda, or maybe a, a great deal of anger on your part, you know, about what he's saying. Yeah, for me, it felt like a, a, an Alice through the looking glass, like a, an inside out version of what I do for a living because I was not looking at him as a patient. If anything, I was feeling like, you know, <laughs> I was in a very vulnerable position and it was, you know, on the world stage. It was not in the privacy of an office where no one knows what's going on except two people. Um, and I knew that, you know, my colleagues would watch, his colleagues would watch. It was terrifying, but it was also an adventure. It, it really felt like something new that I, I'm, you know, I'm glad I got to try. And I, I sort of, I can see myself getting addicted to um, trying other, other people, other settings, other theories, other um, techniques yeah. to, to just get, get people interested in, in the fact that we can make these connections. And I don't think it's all that hard if we try. I think we're just used to this cancel culture where if I don't like you, I have to make you go away. Yeah. Like I said in the original video, I think um, that's that's where we are these days. That's the, the acceptable behavior is um, you, you challenge me, I don't like you, you scare me, so I'm going to make you go away, which is either cancel you, unfriend you, or vote for somebody who's gonna send a drone out to, you know. <laughs> No. Uh, our technology is driving us toward very short attention spans and, right. and ab abilities to tolerate affect. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's the other thing is um, to take advantage of technology to t tolerate affect and process. And we're not like the technology, I think, is, is making it more of a, you know, fix it now. Right. Um, and I'm with you about combining efforts. I, I think I really think that this is about, uh, you know, getting as many people who are serious about bridge building together, and and creating a movement. 
around yeah. this. Lori, wh where are you with all this? Thank you, Sue, for inviting me in on that discussion. I, I wanted to ask you a question, and that was, I appreciate you kind of giving your doubting perspective um, uh, towards the videos, but I wonder if it might be a reflect a reflection of, as Kirk, you mentioned earlier, we have to give up our agenda if we're going to have a dialogue with someone very different. And, and as we watched through this video, uh, the first couple of times, you know, inside, you really want to address uh, what's right or, and what's not right here. Like it, it, you feel it inside you. It's difficult to tolerate. Um, but in our study group and reading, you know, we found that the research was when you have two different groups dialoguing, they don't actually change each other's mind. But when you apply to the group experience, empathy or um, levels of kindness, it softens the, the, the polarized radical uh, view and attitude. That's exactly what we found in our in our dialogue groups and what Graver Angels found in their post-workshop interviews. They found that some 70% of people involved in, in the workshops uh, felt less estranged and less mm -hmm. angry toward their, their opposite partner, if you will. Mm -hmm. just to you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm just saying that and also they felt more understood by mm -hmm. the partner. And it's, it's not really about changing minds in, in, in any overt way. It's much more about attempting to learn about and understand the other. And through that process, enhancing the likelihood that the people will achieve some kind of common ground or a basis mm -hmm. for further dialogue. Yeah. What I was gonna say to you, Lori, is that I, I think Alice holds back on what she thinks. And, and Bobby does not hold back on what he thinks. And mm -hmm. Alice is curious about Bobby. I don't know if Bobby's curious about Alice. I'd like to see some Bobby being curious about Alice. Mm -hmm. You want to see him grow? Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> I think he, he knows a lot about me from my Facebook posts. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add, the, the experiential democracy dialogue would, would very much allow for that because it would be equal time for both to tell their story about their background, yeah. you know, to visualize the dialogue and to talk about how they've been stereotyped mm -hmm. and to correct the false and misleading aspects of that and to identify the nuggets of truth to the stereotyping, open themselves, their vulnerability to each other and, and, and to ask a question from that, again, place of curiosity rather than mm -hmm. presumption. And finally to, uh, see what they've discovered through this process. Um, is there any room for common ground? And if not, yeah. why not? Yeah. Yeah. Do, um, does, does Alice know much? Uh, no, does Bobby know much about Alice? Alice, does he know much about you? you you've told us some of what drives you to do what you do. Uh, does he know? Um, I, if he reads my Facebook posts, he knows, hmm. I, I don't know how much um, he knows. I mean, we've met a couple of times. He took me for pizza once. Um, oh, really? but, yeah, so we've had conversations. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, I, I just want to say, I don't think about it so much as changing minds, as much as understanding the other perspective. Mm -hmm. Like I said in, in the video, I, I like the two-eyed model. You know, a left eye and a right eye. We're programmed to see left and right, but if you adapt, and focus on a shared horizon, you know, you get clarity and perspective and depth perception and you can walk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of when I, when I think of common ground, I think about that, just um, understanding what the other side is seeing um, rather than necessarily changing yourself to become them or embrace them or agree with them, just, um, the opposites coexist, you know, dialectical behavioral therapy is all about that coexistence of opposites. Yeah, 
Why can't we use that in the political arena? Well, I, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. We, we have to wrap up, but um, I don't know if anyone wants to do just one final. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to just say, make a comment about else, else your body of work um, is it reveals to us, we do not know how to deal with difference. In the dualistic world that we're all raised up in, we don't know how to deal with difference. And that's it's what threatening. Yeah. Difference is threatening. So it's our identity. Mm -hmm. That's primal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sue. Uh, do you have anything you want to say before I play your clip? So I picked this segment because I thought it was the closest to my idea of what a dialogue would be. I thought Alice, um, Alice really challenged Bobby on a number of things, um, and a number of his facts and his science. And, um, also it, I, in some ways I kind of agreed with him, but uh, a lot of the things he said, uh, I, I think that the two, again, I think the two of you could engage even further on it. So I'll leave it at that. And then I have some more to say afterwards. There, there is no question that if you follow the science, this is child abuse. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that transgenderism is a mental disorder that merits treatment. Uh, uh, up until last year, the, the World Health Organization recognized transgenderism as a mental disorder. So did the DSM-5, by the way. Okay, now I, I agree that things are changing, but yes. that doesn't mean that they're changing for the better. The science is being influenced by the politics, and that's wrong. Right. And but the science shows that gender and sexuality is not linear. It may not even be on a, on a linear spectrum. It's so multifaceted. I agree with you that we shouldn't jump in and say, ah, the answer to your problem is that your kid is, is you know, a, a girl in a boy's body or a boy in a girl's body. And here, you know, wear these clothes, use these bathrooms, see this doctor, everything will be right. It's you know, there are genetic variants, but then there's the way kids are treated, whether they're traumatized, abused, raped, uh, overly supported in one direction or another, peer pressures, school pressure. It's so multi-determined so, uh, so quickly that you can't say that any particular child is destined to be a happy adult if they go in this path or that path. Now, what to do about it, I don't know. But except to honor these people's experience, that, that if you feel like you're in the wrong body, don't argue with them and say, God said you're not. Um, let, just honor their experience and then give them time to figure well, out. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, people that, that suffer from gender dysphoria are just as human as, as everybody else. They deserve respect and, and all the civil rights that everybody else is entitled to. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, but what I do have a problem with is, you know, the fact that this, it, this agenda is being pushed on children so young. Okay, we're talking three, four-year-old kids. Well, Avery Jackson was, uh, was only uh, four years old when his parents started giving him hormones. And uh, the I Am Jazz Girl was, was, uh, had, was given artificial hormones to, uh, to, to stop her or for him or her what she ended up uh, her uh cut off his genitalia okay that's an irreversible thing okay now i've, I've gone over the statistics 81.7 percent of transgenders reported suicidal ideation in the 25 2015 transgender report okay 40 uh 43 point cent 43.8 percent of them actually attempted suicide in that year Okay, that's, you know, prima facie evidence that these people are, are, are disturbed, and they need treatment. Now, what is what, excuse me, what is the, uh, what is the, what is the, the problem? I'm not sure. I'm thinking that these are uh, gay individuals that are having a problem accepting the fact that they are gay. Okay, they, they, they have uh, feelings for a person of the same sex. And, and they wonder why they, they but and but they are wondering the, the wrong thing. 
and it's being encouraged by these psychiatrists that uh, say that uh, trans transgenderism is, is is normal. You know, like being gay. You know, maybe being gay is genetic. I don't know. I, uh, may I maybe Gaga, Gaga is right. Maybe they're born that way. I don't care. Okay, but what I do care about is this agenda being pushed on children so young. If you're an adult and you want to cut your pee-pee off, baby, let your freak flag fly and wear a dress and woohoo, I don't care. But let the little babies alone. Let them grow up in accordance with natural childhood development, okay, without pushing your social agenda on them and totally screwing them up. But if their natural childhood development is to feel different from their there are girlfriends who don't, maybe they don't want to play with dolls. Maybe they want to, or, or maybe they. they no, we used different. to call those tomboys. You know, yeah. Um, you can at least respect that children have different centers, different feeling states, different desires, different fantasies, different, and just honor it. I, I agree that we don't have to jump in and say, you know, God made you a girl, so you're stuck with it. Or no, you can be a boy. Let's go do. Pre we don't want to do that prematurely because things will shift. Different insights can emerge. Um, just give it time. Give, give honor these kids' inner experience, and and give them time to to have it evolve, and not jump in and use a parental agenda or a political agenda or social agenda. To, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're talking about nature versus nurture. You're absolutely right. And uh, what's affecting these child's experience are parents that are telling them that this is normal. It's a very simple thing. That is the problem. Parents are using their own social agenda to influence the life of their child in, in opposition to normal uh, uh, uh development and and that that's just that's just what it is it's basically i'm blaming the parents because the parents are the ones that go out and get the doctors that sexually mutilate their children give them hormones that delay and and stop uh normal puberty okay it did it, it, it's just insane i can't believe that I, I this don't is do happening to our children because you're right i don't feel comfortable making those kinds of of, of choices but if i see a, a child or an adolescent like that, I will just say, tell me about your experience. What's it like to be you? And start from there and help the kid figure out what it's like to be them, all the different forces that impinge on them from inside and outside and help them arrive at a choice for themselves and, and you know, listening to the other voices, but not, not uh, obeying the other voices. Um, right, now I agree with you totally. Uh, you, that, that's a wonderful idea. Ask them why they feel the way they do. Help them work through this process. Do you expect it to happen overnight? No. No, it's good. Therapy takes years. You know this, Alice. Okay, yeah. let, them, let them work through it, but let them take time. You don't need to give them hormones that's going to change the, you know, the people get it in their heads that it's, that it's normal and it's not. And it's reinforced by a leftist agenda that, that wants to destroy the family structure in the United States, you can go to Black Lives Matter's website this very moment and read their manifesto. It states that they want to destroy the nuclear family. They don't want, they don't care about uh, uh, mothers and fathers living together. And you know what? That's, that's a Marxist uh, uh, plot to destroy this country. So, in the interest of full disclosure, there were a couple of cuts in that video. So again, you can see the full conversation uh, between Alice and Bobby on our YouTube channel. You can find a link to our YouTube channel at wagingdialogue.org. But there were a couple of cuts in that video to keep it from going on too long. Uh, Sue? So I think that this would have been, this could be a topic that you and Bobby could really engage in more fully. Uh, I, you know, you're a mental health professional. I thought it was interesting that he doesn't ask you, what do you think about this? Um, he makes some assertions, 
that I think are, you know, not following the science at all if he was a mental health professional. He says that Freud and Erickson both said that prepubescent kids can't think of themselves as sexual. Now, I think he's confusing gender identity with sexual orientation. Gender identity is knowing whether you're a boy or girl. And my science says that children form their gender identity between 18 and 24 months. And most um, know whether they're a boy or a girl by the time that they're three years old. Sexual orientation is who you wanna have sex with. He seems to be conflating those two things. Um, and it's, it is true that uh, the medical community did classify gender dysphoria as a, as a mental disorder, but the World Health Organization removed gender nonconformity from its list of mental disorders. And gender disorder, gender dysphoria is included in the DSM-5. Bobby is correct about that. Um, but he didn't mention that the treatment for gender dysphoria is support and affirm, affirmation. And they go on to say that it's noted that family and societal rejection of gender identity are some of the strongest predictors of mental health difficulties among people who are transgender. These are my facts. So, um, you know, I agree with him that jumping in and um, trying to change somebody's um, uh, gender identity is, is bad. I mean, but, but I don't really think that parents are actually doing that. I mean, I, I don't know where he gets the idea that uh, little kids of three and four are getting um, puberty blockers or having their genitalia cut off. I, that, that seems like hysteria to me. That, I don't think that's actually happening. And what concerns me about it is he, he, he seems so sure of himself. Where does he get this from? Does he know any trans kids? Um, you know, all of us who are in the mental health field are quite perplexed about this and where to go with it. Why is he so certain? And I, you know, I just wonder if it would have been possible or would be possible in the future for you to engage him in not knowing so with such certainty about these things. They're great questions and certainly for the future. Um, as I said, I, I didn't feel at that point that I wanted to challenge um, his certainty because it, it, it just didn't feel like it was, um, and maybe I was thinking like a, a psychoanalyst that there are questions that, you know, I would jot down for a future reference, but I wouldn't raise in a first session, <laughs> you know. Did you have any thoughts about why he, he gets so uh, angry about this? I think a lot of my friends on the right are angry about it because they see it as child abuse. Um, to, to just call children's attention to gender and sexuality before or when they really should not be thinking about those things. And I, there may be truth to that because it's everywhere. Um, I, I don't see uh, young children in my practice, but I see a lot of adolescents and they all say the same thing. Yeah, we're all non-binary. Non we don't care. It's the parents' problem. You know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of leave it at that. I, mean, um, I agree that maybe there's too much affirmation and not enough exploration. I would agree with him about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My uh, uh, my daughter, when she was like uh, nine and ten, she's fourteen now. But uh, uh, she, it, it's amazing to hear her talk about her friends and and how gender fluid they are, and how even now, uh, kind of sexually uh, fluid they are with uh, who do I like and and uh, and her friend who used to be Michelle, but now he's Michael, and so call him Michael when he comes over because that's who he is, and and. Uh, and it's just no big deal. And uh, uh, I, I, I really appreciate the, the Gen Z kind of uh, fluidity about it. Uh, uh, is, and, I, I, you know, it seems like that's uh, the uh, antithesis to, uh, you know, uh, uh, millennials trying to either define their kids as always being their biologic gender or I suppose Bobby could be right that there are cases in which uh, uh, parents uh, 
pick up on some perceived cue that their kids are actually some other gender and push it on them. I, I, like Alice is saying, these stories are pervasive enough that maybe there are some cases. And uh, uh, I think Bobby, uh, uh, um, he's using those cases as uh, evidence that's a, a problem across the board that is uh, a problem. Uh, but as Sue's talking, I'm, I'm uh, wondering if, um, I'm wondering if there is a way, you know, if Alice talks to Bobby again or with Bobby, I mean, uh, uh, an interesting slip, you know, uh, I, I, I identify with her um, holding her own in the conversation with, with Bobby, uh, but, uh, but, you know, can they get to where they really hear each other's point of view and, and uh, uh, really appreciate in depth. I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, I think it's Spinoza. There's a philosopher that talks about dualities and, and, and the only way to transcend the duality is have basically the view of God, that there is a great spirit that can see all. But beyond that, we're stuck with dualities, mind versus body, uh, maybe right versus left. Can they come together? Maybe. Um, if anybody can, they have a good chance at it. So I, I remember um, last year I, I, I did a presentation at Hunter High School and um, I went to the bathroom before the presentation and I came out of the bathroom and there was a teenage boy there. And I realized I was in one of those bathrooms, you know, for any and all. And it was disconcerting. It was the first time I'd been in one of those. <laughs> But I, you know, um, but you know the pronouns. When you talk to students, they uh, on Zoom, they all and teachers, they all have their pronouns, and it's it, you know I can see the controversy. I I I really can, um, and I go with whatever seems like appropriate at the time. Um, I'm not gonna argue with somebody who wants it or doesn't want it, but it's, it's, um, it's interesting times when everybody can pick their pronoun. Uh, so you asked the question, where do you think um, Bobby gets the certainty? And I, I think that question maybe is a good time to bring in um, the listserv's response to Alice's video. Because uh, for like the thought leader like Bobby representing um, a more fundamental perspective, like he's exhibiting this group narcissism that demands the leaders have a certainty about them. Mm. The interesting thing in our listserv, we also see a group narcissism, don't we? And by that, I mean malignant, not a narcissism that's uh, producing a good uh, product or result into the world, but who's you know, self-congratulatory about um, being this group of um, superior yeah, intellect. People were so, so sure that what Alice was doing was dangerous and there was so little curiosity about it. Yeah, yeah I really felt like I, I was being accused of giving voice to evil. And I was told that by, by any number of different people. So you see how both groups, if we were just to take the two groups, they both use this like ad hominem fallacies, you know, like this horrible evil that's being done by voicing a view um, or the, you know, um, the, the, the just, you know, verdicts, I think that Bobby makes of particular people, uh, Obama or um, evil parents. <laughs> You know, I, I think it's an example again of, of fear-based mentalities, mm -hmm. whether yes. left or right. I mean, we're all subject to those at, at various times and in various degrees, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the bigger issue, I believe, is the need to address the fear, the primal fear mm -hmm. in, in a significant way. Very, very tough tough challenge, obviously. Uh, so how do we do that? <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you that question as well, Kirk. Like, well, one thing we would know if, you, if we want to be able to address a fear, we have to 
acknowledge that it exists or normalize it. And that wouldn't be by debate, would it? Sure. Right. It would have to be um, by a more, say, in Alice's uh, role, intuiting what really internally drives or motivates Bobby and not exposing it, um, but knowing it, right? And in that giving the capacity to hold or contain um, his passionate intensity. <laughs> and I think we would need to do that with all the psychoanalysts who reacted yes. so yeah. explosively about this issue. Yeah. It would be fascinating to, mm -hmm. to do some, you know, dialogue yeah. formats with you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> All right. Um, should we go on? Sure. Yeah, right. let's try to have some time for discussion because yeah, uh, yeah, really I'm trying to move on want to say things. Faster. Sorry, yeah. guys, I'm doing the, doing the best I can. Um, hmm. All right. So we are going to go with, we're going to go on to Lori now. Uh, is it, Lori, is there anything you want to say before we go? Yeah, I, um, I picked a very early moment in the dialogue and then the very end because I wanted to, to um, highlight what I believe is seen throughout here, a thread of how psychoanalytic ideas inform us as, in a way to be transformative in a... Um, in, in the relationship. And I think that's exactly what manifests here with Alice and Bobby. So go ahead and play that. All right. I'm the only voice that this child has had for nine years. Nobody cares about him anymore. Obama was great because he killed Abdul or Anwar al -Laki. with Again, without charges, no far away from a battlefield totally illegally with his pen and phone. Yeah. It didn't even take anything to the FISA court. He just ordered the CIA to murder an American citizen who was not engaged in combat. Okay, but he was a terrorist, I agree. Okay, he had it coming to him. But his 16-year-old son, who was killed two weeks after, did not. He was an innocent child, and nobody gives a damn. I and agree, but, but mistakes are made, and, and yeah, when we fight wars, Things happen, and and you there was, know, it was Alice. It oh. wasn't on a battlefield. And, and it I was know, a premeditated drone strike. Drone strikes are a whole other thing. Yeah, I I know people who have you know kids in the military who are learning to fight drones from the safety of some military base out in in, in the states, and they kill people, and that that is a problem. There's no doubt about it. But I think that's an issue that the left and the right um, could argue. Uh, in different ways and in, in different circumstances right. you know, we we kill each other we're, we're, we're yeah killing species. we are killing species. Are killing species. and 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 uh you know you've got we've got instincts and emotions and we've got intellect too that has to take over because mm -hmm. we cannot let our emotions run wild the result would be massive bloodshed yeah. okay and that's what i'm trying to stop okay and but these people that are judging me just by the color of my skin or by the color of a hat that I wear. They need to understand that when they're canceling me, they're canceling 264 victims of sexual rape and uh, sexual assault and rape that has been committed by members of Congress and the Senate since 1997. You know, it, it's against science to, to think that, uh, you know, these young children can, uh, can have these sexual thoughts and what we've got to do okay, is place emotions, you know, underneath, you know, in empirical fact, okay, it nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings, at least none of the people that I know, I, I certainly don't, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But doggone it, I'm not going to deny what I know to be a scientific fact, in order to perpetuate uh, somebody's delusion. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if it hurts their feelings. I'm not doing it on purpose. 
I'm not doing it with the intention of hurting your feelings, but facts are facts. There are 24 hours a day. The sky is blue on a sunny day. I mean, there are certain things that just cannot be denied. And one thing is a, that can't be denied is a three-year-old, four-year-old child can't think of themselves as a sexual object. Well, that's, that's questionable, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's for another topic. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've had a great conversation. We've been going over an hour. This is fun, Alice. We should do this again. Well, there you have it. Do you not? Um, <laughs> To, to forgive me to use just a bit of clinical terms in a very simplified way. In the beginning, we see uh, Bobby in, in a more schizoid position. It's like he's, he's alone. Um, he's, he, this, there's a paranoia that others are, are, are against him. And at the end, he makes the statement, nobody wants to hurt anybody. There's this transformation of now Bobby's mentalizing others, right? That you know, no one wants to hurt anybody. And we had a great time, Alice. You know, he really is appreciating you. And so because of the, the style of the dialogue, there is um, what I see less of this um, more inward self-focus and now um, being, uh, related to others and that's that's something i think is uh, we are always working for in a psychological development in the person um, so i, I we. yes we. We. yeah so i have a question that i'd like to pose for you to consider or imagine what has drawn bobby to, to participate in this public dialogue with Alice. What drives him? I don't want to put words in his mouth. So um, Bobby, if you're listening, forgive me if I get this wrong. <laughs> but but he did say at this at, at some point to his, his on his own Facebook page that this he considered this his legacy, that this is something important that he mm -hmm. had done. And I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure why he would say that or why I feel that way, but it feels important. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's so simple. I mean, I, at the end there, I was just relieved that I'd survived it. <laughs> and, you know, I could show it on, on YouTube and, and not, hold, you know, hide my head in shame. <laughs> and that's what I was feeling at that moment. But but it does feel like there's something important here. Um, and I, I don't know if he felt anything similar, um, but and I'm not sure what that is, but it would be helpful to try to articulate what that is. You know, uh, there's a paper, uh, uh, Jeff Andreessen wrote a paper on awe, awe, A-W-E, and how uh, it's an emotional indicator of, of that which is uh, uh, greater than ourselves. And, 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 and Alice and, and I guess Lori brought up too the, the importance of this for, for both Alice and uh, Bobby. And, and, uh, uh, and, and they may, so I'm wondering if they're referring in part to, uh, the, uh, to the, um, what Lori was bringing up at the beginning of the video, where where uh, 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 Bobby spoke as if Alice was not there, uh, he was by himself, and and I think Alice felt that way too, uh, mm -hmm. it, like she was just kind of the recipient of this stuff. Mm -hmm. When uh, and and somehow they they through mutual agreement uh, through the friendship that they uh, had begun to build or an alliance at least, uh, uh, they they knew that there was something human about the other one, person, and and so all these. Uh, um, this history that I suspect that they both have of 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 seeing the the uh, the schism in in society and between people and and that being bigger than life and the uh, resonating with the like I was saying earlier the kind of the fantasy under the surface that we kind of live through and and see the world through uh, wait it's not that it's not simply that it's it's something more there there we can connect and and uh, uh, and so uh, so for them to take this one step okay so it's one interaction uh, uh, and hopefully there will be many both between Alice and Bobby and and many like it uh, uh, for us to overcome, for to transcend that duality, 
mm-hmm. brings this hugeness, this sense of awe to mm-hmm. these kinds of experiences. I, I, I think it relates to uh, Lori's uh, reference to the to the the schism that people feel sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that brings up the uh, significance of spirituality here. Mm-hmm that there is a kind of spirituality in play, which revolves around discovery, humility, and and I would define all as humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living. Mm -hmm. You use the word adventure, Alice. I'd like to also draw a parallel to a recent Rand Corporation study that showed that ex-members of extremist religious and political groups found uh, that being talked at or taught to behave differently only hardened their stance and made them more polarized. The thing that seemed to help the most was their exposure to people of diverse backgrounds. That blew the lid off their uh, conditioning that these others are demons or monsters. It disconfirmed their their leader's view and the kind of cultist uh, um, obsession about us, them. And uh, I I think that's partly what this is demonstrating too, is person to person exposure. What's what's been interesting to me is I feel like in the process of doing this, I've refound something I would call religion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't. I, I was raised Catholic. Um, I, I I'm not. I, you know, I don't believe in in the literalness of any church. At, um, but there's something about this I thou thing. I find myself going back there. Yeah. Um, the, you know, speaking to another person as as a moral equivalent um you know taking away the psychopathology and the political wrongness and 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 just honoring the humanity of the other mm-hmm. feels like it's bringing me back there um and a lot of my my friends on the right are saying see you you know god you found god <laughs> you're one of us <laughs> you know you and, and you know you're you're, a, you're one of the christians i knew it all along <laughs> And I'm a little it's thrown off because, like, are they right? <laughs> uh, one, one short comment in response to Lori's question. I think that the reason Bobby does this is because you listen to him and you acknowledge him. And um, you're a very, very good listener. And the way people learn to be good listeners is by having someone listen to them. And I'm hoping that Bobby will learn to be a good listener by being listened to by you. And maybe I'll learn more facts and how to argue that. But I think your point about spirituality is, is an important one. That that, that is mm-hmm. a, a common a common bridge. Mm-hmm. That that is uh, something that I think we do and can share in common as human beings, whether we're religious or secular. The sense of participating in something much greater than ourselves. Yeah. Very powerful and uplifting yeah well and in the beginning of the clip um alice you show us your humanity and i felt very strongly your anxiousness um you 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 stutter a bit even uh you give an illustration that just doesn't land anywhere and it you're 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 working with all your determination right to connect with um you know your other um party here with bobby and so Mm -hmm. that has to be really validating to come to the end Mm -hmm. and feel the way you do yeah and hear bobby mirror that back to you he feels the same way this was great yeah yeah Yeah, i felt that way i was absolutely terrified at the beginning because you know he he just he had the technique down for how to you know argue in public Mm -hmm. um and i'd never done this before and i was uh, was terrified um but yeah it i just i felt much more comfortable by the end that we got into some rhythm yeah Um, different but some something that sort of worked and without your training without your 
you know, particular um, goal of creating these kinds of dialogues, most people would flee or fight, right? And uh, so, Kirk, I appreciated in the beginning you making reference to um, trauma being influencing uh, mm -hmm. dynamics. And you can see that, I think, with the way Bobby begins the video with basically pushing you away with his, his um, strident opinion, with the, his tone, the volume of his voice. Yeah. And, and uh, he has had some really awful knocks in life. Awful. Really. And uh, so he's accustomed to people, you know, at minimum judging him, right? Or, or, uh, or yeah. attacking him. And so this is a defense of, that you, you demonstrate for us this capacity to tolerate that intensity, to tolerate the tension. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, he was in the military at 16. His parents yeah. let him lie about his age to join the Marines. Yeah, and that definitely would, if there's any positive self-esteem or narcissism, beat down yeah. right away. All right. Um, should we go to questions? Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we got a lot of questions. I will do them in the order that they came in. Um, so our first question is two questions. When someone feels abandoned by the system, it is obviously hard to try and understand the particulars of the system. There has been such a determined effort to overturn the ACA and states failing to take federal money that was available. How do we approach giving the other person a more realistic picture of why the system failed them? In the wealthiest country, there is no reason to pick and choose who is allowed to go hungry, sleep on the street, or be denied hospice care. The other question is, who decides, sorry, who gets to decide what normal is? My great grandson dressed as a princess in his pre kindergarten years. His very macho looking father put on a princess clown and makeup along with his son. To me, that is normal and not any kind of pressure. I ask those two as one because they're from the same person. Uh, you, all, you all can see the QA, right? So if you need to refer to the question, it's, it's just at the bottom of the screen. I don't think I'm seeing all of them. I, like, I didn't see the questions you just uh, asked. Uh, can you, you, you open the Q&A and you see, do you see six questions? Oh, Q&A, I was looking at the chat, sorry. Uh, yeah. okay. All right, uh, anyone? Well, I guess the question is um, in the middle there, how do we approach giving the other person a more realistic picture of why the system failed them? Um, and I guess I don't have an answer to that because I feel like um, that wasn't our direction that our dialogue is going in today. So anyone else? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think this is about giving the other something that you believe or your, your agenda per se. It's much more about learning about and attempting to understand the other and in the hopes that they too will attempt to learn about and understand you because you're modeling that to some degree. And uh, out of that, hopefully uh, you, you both can come to some kind of livable perspectives or at least be able to live with each other without shooting each other or are screaming at each other. I, th I think that's a very admirable goal these days. <laughs> I'd be very curious to know more. I don't know if, you know, what setting would be appropriate to explore that, but actually what happened? You know, what's the Michigan system like with healthcare and hospice and Obamacare and funding and what their personal experience was, why that happened? is a very complex um, problem. 
and each state is different, the laws are different, the way they're used is different. The, the, um, I, I see that sometimes with my patients and I kind of give that to social workers or because or, <laughs> I, I don't know enough about how the system works. I know sometimes people take advantage of the system. Sometimes people don't know how to use the system. Sometimes the system works for them. Sometimes it doesn't. There are very complicated uh, problems in there. Um, psychological, practical. Um, I, I would like to think that if we had enough people to share their experiences, that we could come up with some fixes that sure. would actually be more effective than what we have now. Now it's global, you know, keep it or toss it. And toss it, we'll have nothing, but maybe we'll have something, but we're not telling you what we're gonna have to replace it. It's just gonna be better. That makes no sense, but we can make sense if we if we explore it. Um, it might be useful to go into more detail about what happened with, with the death of his wife. But I don't again don't know if that, that's at all appropriate. Yeah, I would I would have really been curious to know why she was denied services. But I'm not sure I understand the question. Can it, someone sort of restate it for me? Um. I think we've kind of transcended the question now into sort of the process of the conversation. And um, in like that, how do you talk to about a person who feels like they've been failed by the system? How do you? Yeah, and and the systems failed them, but but Bobby was pointing out the unfairness as in the dreamers getting uh, resources. And perhaps on the non-intellectual but more human level to be able to identify with Bobby and say, this was such a horrible tragedy to lose your wife um, to cancer and watch her suffer in pain without alleviation of that. No wonder you feel such animosity towards dreamers who are getting things taken care of for them when you couldn't get that for your wife. Like that's really where we yeah. connect, right? Yeah. And no yeah. one, no yeah. one would argue that. Right. And if we did it within our experiential dialogue format, both people, both parties would have a full chance to describe their stance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that could be another way of at least providing a window, for, let's say, for Bobby to maybe have a more realistic picture of, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on in the system, and and uh, and using your categories of content and process, like Alice, you as you said, you're not uh, knowledgeable about all these political issues, and so we're not really coming at that kind of conversation. Like, what you know. How did, how did all those things really play out? But more about um, understanding your view of the world based on something very, very traumatic that happened to you. And that I think has been part of your drive, is it not? And yeah. creating dialogues of uh, um, teaching how to empathize. I just have to say, to what extent did do you think Bobby might have latched on to the um, to Obamacare? Um, and you know, I'm saying this knowing that this would probably make him really angry. That out of a sense of racism, you know, that uh, Obama was black, the um, the migrants are other, they're getting, and he's not getting. You know, that, that seems to be a trope of um, a lot of the political dialogue that goes on uh, I think, that I, think I deserve and, and that they don't deserve it. Yeah, I, I don't, I think he would be uh, upset at calling it a racial issue. Mm -hmm. um, we're Americans, you, you know, we worked hard our whole lives as Americans. And then these people are coming in and they're going to get our health care, and they're going to get free college, and they're going to get, you know, lots of programs and support, and take it away from us. And the fact that they happen to be a different race, I don't think. I think that's secondary. I don't think that's the primary thing. And I think they bristle 
when they're accused of, of racism being the primary uh, factor. Alice promised us that she would, she would uh, channel Bobby, so I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, uh, let's try to move a little bit faster. Um, sorry. Uh, the, so the next question um, is similar. So just let me know if you think we've touched on this already. But I also wonder how propaganda fits in with this. How do we address those who are deliberately spreading falsehoods as propaganda to divide us? Have we touched on this? And can anyone here propose even an answer to it? Propaganda, which question is this, Matt? So, so this is, uh, I appreciate bringing people together. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, okay. You know, when I've got a neighbor, uh, I, I hope he's not listening, but maybe he is, and, and he has <laughs> this intense way of, of uh, taking, um, you know, uh, kind of sound bites from uh, his favorite political positions, uh, news sources, uh, and and making a stand about it, and and uh, and it's us versus them. It's kind of uh, like a um, loyalty to a football team, uh, and and uh, and and I think he's coming. I, I don't know what drives his emotional kind of. Uh, loyalty to that point of view uh, or the uh, kind of seeing the other position as uh, utterly wrong like he does. Uh, but but I find myself bristling with like, what, you know, and, and, and I want to come back at him with the same emotional force. Uh, and, and I, part of how I do it with my neighbor, and I think Alice did with, uh, with Bobby, and in general, uh, as, as psychoanalysts and as humans, if we can uh, uh, use that emotional kind of uh, weight as, uh, as a communication. I mean, he's trying to say something, and I, I don't know if, if he has a history of trauma or if he um, uh, feels uh, powerless or alone and so jumps into this uh, kind of debate uh, uh, to feel more powerful uh, uh, or, or if it's just fun for him. I, I can't quite tell, and, uh, but uh, in any case, I take it with this emotional weight and uh, I process the emotion. Wait a second, this is, this is my, my friend here that, uh, uh, I, I have had good times with. I mean, so I humanize him. I, I understand his subjectivity, but also I, I process the emotions. Wait a second. This is not hurting me. He's trying to communicate something to me. Uh, we can't do much about uh, except for grassroots movements and voting uh, uh, about propaganda, uh, but uh, but we can do something about the uh, uh, the way we hear people kind of buying into the propaganda. What was that term that we all liked? Um, uh, somebody from another group who argues against type. The oh, what was that called? That was such a great term. Yeah, uh, where uh, where it's it's uh, unexpected, right? It's a leader yeah. in, within a group that believes a certain way, but the but the person in that group that's respected among that group uh, uh, says the opposite of what you'd expect, uh, and and owns that. Well, wait a second. There's another way to see this, and and therefore it filters down into that group, right? There's a term for that. I can't remember. Yeah. It. Does anyone even in the audience remember what this is? There's somebody in the audience who might remember this. I can't think of it. Can't. Um, but but it, it what it speaks to is like if you can if, if you can become a respected person, which you have, Alice, with somebody with very different views from you, that gives you some clout with that person. Yeah, I, so, I surprising validator. Yeah, Alex Collot. Thank you. Surprising validator. Yeah, that's right. You could be a surprising validator. I think we all would like to be surprising validators. Yes, yes, yeah. Exactly. Well, and um, I think we had an example of that with like President Trump when he was um, uh, supportive and favorable towards the vaccine, but in a whole lot of other ways, more, much more, um, you know, casual and yeah. cavalier. Yeah. You know, one thought that I've, I've had is that some of the extreme ideas that people have, the ones that seem crazy, 
um, on both sides. Uh, I, I'm not going to, you know, just accuse the right of being. It, it, it's, it makes me think about symptoms in individuals. They can seem crazy, but if you attack the symptom, you're not going to get very far. Yeah. Maybe you will if you're a behaviorist or give them the right, you know, medication. But if you understand the origin of the 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 symptom, why it rose to the top. Mm -hmm. then it will go away by itself. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I hear things like, oh my God, Trump is this horrible, how dare we have elected? He, he represents something. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we listen to that something, um, I think that's more disarming than you know, a head-on fight with a symptom. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's so much the disinformation that's the issue. It's more, why are people susceptible to that disinformation? And being able to open to that. If you hear the truth, the, 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 if you validate the truth underneath the falsehood, yes. it, it'll make more sense than if you keep yeah. yelling that this is wrong. And, and I feel more. Know. That, that's why I didn't argue um, a lot with his facts. Um, I feel more understood. You know, arguing or yelling, of course, that's not going to be effective. But I could imagine you saying, Alice, to Bobby, um, when he talked about the, the Marxist plot to destroy families um, yeah. with Black Lives Matter and, um, and Margaret Sanger being a eugenicist, I could imagine you saying, whoa, whoa, let's, uh, let's look at this. Not Next yelling time. at him. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're getting me going. <laughs> um, all right. So, two, so the next question is, two words have stood out to me in this webinar slash conversation, respect and uncertainty. They seem to go together. Our recognition of personal limits, our own and others, puts us under a common sky. For Alex, do you channel the good enough mother in your way of thinking of these conversations with Bobby? I know you're gonna like this question. Um, Are I, you Bobby's mother? <laughs> <laughs> have to ask him. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's part of the uh, dynamic that I think about when I work and I've been working for 45 years. So maybe that did somehow come into the arena. I certainly wanted to create a holding space <laughs> where we could both engage with each other. And if that's a good enough mother, fine. I'll, I'll, I, you know, it depends on how you define mother. I certainly was not in any way intending to be motherly um, but more just just uh, a holding space where people could uh, connect and bond and attach and, and, and feed each other. Sure. All right. Um, so the next person says, I wanted to comment. I have a very gifted patient, a young man who, is also, who also is diagnosed with Asperger's. Often he sounds just like Bobby, and I think it feels good to him. I try to both resonate and question. I sound a little like Alice, but I think of Holloway's observation that a bully victim thing is ubiquitous in this group. Someone else thought that bully victim was also an attempt to understand the early trauma of giftedness or Asperger's. It made me wonder if there is a bully victim aspect in the culture, the patient feels himself to be a victim and is quite articulate, but has trouble seeing his own bullying. Just like Bobby, who was bullying Alice at times, so it takes some doing to keep a conversation going with this patient, which also Alice does quite well. Now, now I don't know if you agree with that comment or if you have anything to say with that comment, about that comment, but. Um... You know, the people that, um, uh, I'm, I'm reminded, I, I don't know enough about child psychology and bully victim, uh, but um, uh, a related thing, uh, sadomasochism, uh, people that uh, seem to enjoy uh, uh, manipulating others and, and uh, uh, enjoy um, 
uh, or being gratified by uh, seeing, taking control, I guess, uh, 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 obtaining power over <laughs> others, often in the end uh, uh, have um, uh, kind of a dependency on that person that they're uh, manipulating. Uh, and and it, it seems to me in my experience uh, uh, reflects uh, kind of a, a need on their part, uh, not just to, to manipulate the other person, but, but to uh, feel more complete in some way. And, and, and so, um, uh, so, but it becomes tricky as a therapist, uh, you know, if, if you've got a patient who's purposefully trying to make you feel bad, uh, how do you uh, approach that? Uh, you can't, in my experience uh, and opinion, just accept and keep feeling bad because it just kind of perpetuates itself forever. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but to somehow point out that you, you seem to be gratified by this kind of manipulation. And, uh, um, uh, and if they're able to tolerate that, or if you find a language to discuss that in, uh, you do start getting to their, their need uh, not just to do that, but for the other person that's never been met in their life before. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I, saying, you know, I, I feel like you're bullying me. You, I, I'm going to channel Bobby again. Um, and it, maybe not so much him, but the, his friends from the right. They will all say the same thing. The left are the ones who are bullying. And we are just responding. We will not allow ourselves to be controlled. And so we will fight back. So they consider themselves fighting back against the bullying of the left. And the, the left is, is doing it by trying to control thought and language and behavior. Don't use this word. Don't think that thought. Don't feel those feelings. Um, you know, we all need to... Uh, you know, love and respect people of different races and religions and sexualities and this and that. But if you're a Trump supporter, you're a stupid, crazy, evil, low life Nazi. <laughs> Didn't Kirk say yeah. earlier that yeah. polarized mind knows no political position? <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's it's both ways, right? Both ways. Yep. So you're talking in, in in terms of groups, like when when you talked about racial matter. And Bobby said, how'd that work out for you? Blah, 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 blah. He was bullying you at that moment. If, I wonder if you had called him on that. Yeah, I could have. I, I, I could have said, hey, let me finish my sentence. That, that's, that I was going in a different direction. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah I, I kind of let that happen. Partially because I was, I didn't trust myself to, to hold my own and, and, and argue a point. So, uh, but, at, you know, in another setting, I, I would probably have said, well, let me finish. Well, to some degree, this question and other questions bring up the whole question of the limitations of a dialogue format, too. Uh, at what point is there no place for dialogue? Mm. My belief is if there's an imminent threat to you or to society from that person, and of course, it has to be defined, right? We all have to sort of soul search as to what we mean by imminent threat. <clears throat> Maybe that isn't the place for attempting to learn about and understand more of where that person's coming from, <laughs> because you've got to deal with the imminent threat. That also, that's also, yeah. also brings up the whole issue of the point of no return. Right. And, um, and there, again, the people on the right will say, we are going to fight. We are not going to accept this. And you have to understand that we are, you know, that violence will happen and it will be your fault. Um, that my, my feeling is that if we can start here and let the thoughtful people, the people capable of dialogue rise to the top, then those people won't take over, which right now they do. The, the people who can, do what we're doing are too, you know, undercover and in, inarticulate. Um, where the independents and the moderates who like go along with our lives and don't say anything, and the extremists rise up, and they're going to kill each other and take us along with them. If if we can start a movement where nuance trumps, you know, uh, black and white, then maybe we'll get some. Maybe the the others will become singularities and not. Hostage takers. 
I totally agree with you. We've got to marginalize the the extreme yeah. and <clears throat> appeal to the many people of the critical mass who I think are interested in some greater degree of bridge building yeah. and are sick and tired of the divisiveness also. And, and we also have to be able to tolerate the uncomfortable conversations more, I think, in our culture. I think that book by uh, Jonathan Haidt and someone else, The Coddling of the American Mind, it's, you know, that's an important, it raises important questions about whether people can enter uncomfortable conversations and still exist with one another. So I, I want to balance that equation because um, Alice, you said the people on the right, you know, feel attacked and will fight back. The people on the left, same, right? Same. And uh, the level of violence, we all got to witness that in the, in the, the vocabularies of our listserv, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, exactly. So um, I think okay. that's commonality that is in all of us is uh, a field that we can meet at. <laughs> yeah, and remind people on the listserv that they wouldn't be reacting that way with their patients. <laughs> mm -hmm. And why is that? Yeah, so, yeah. So many interesting right, um, in the chat also. Yeah, uh, do we have time for one more question or maybe two? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Sure. Um, at some level, I'm troubled by the underlying assumption in the conversation that the only person to be understood or transformed growth in some way is seen to be Bobby. Is this because the conversation is only among us? Quote. To what degree does it fly in the face of an intention to have a mutual conversation or reveal an implicit bias among us? Well, I'd like to speak to that in the sense that I do believe I use the word transform um, and retract if I spoke as though Bobby is the one being transformed. Um, I need to retract that and say it is in the dialogue created by Bobby and Alice that a transformation took place. And so her anxiety in the beginning and her fumbling around and bumbling and using illustrations that really didn't connect well and, and Bobby's loud volume, they weren't really connecting, but a transformation happened between them that I, I do point to Alice as being the one facilitating that because you've spent a lot of time thinking about how to do this. Yeah. And Ideally, both people would be transformed, right? Oh, I, I feel yes. it, yeah. definitely transformed. And, and not just, you know, a, a, as a, a good therapist hour, but more that I learned something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like I was um, shifting in the way that I thought about a lot of things, which it, itself was destabilizing. Yeah. Because when I thought I was going to argue, I felt found myself um, not unable to argue because his point was well taken. and. And you know, not what I expected. I, um, so yeah, I, it, unfortunately, he's not here. So I, I again apologize to him for talking about him. I would love to have another group with him and his his friends. Um, and I would say that the, there was a mutual conversation, but the end of the clip, you see a mutual respect. Not that it wasn't always there, but you you know. That was one of my desires is to highlight a mutual respect. And, and this has been my experience in these dialogue groups. I've been extremely surprised by the people I've felt closer to by the end of the workshops, mm -hmm. let's say. And, and, and the kinds of things we talk about may have nothing to do with the policies we're discussing at all. It had to do with, you know, maybe remembering something about the sports team from our, you know, mutual city. Uh, or, or doing something with our family. Yeah. But I, I think the question is well taken. Uh, I, I have to fight with myself not to identify with Alice and uh, uh, and and against Bobby uh, as if it's uh, 
uh, as if somebody's right and somebody's wrong, uh, kind of on an ultimate level. Uh, uh, and I think that's the human condition. I think we have to uh, uh, fight to kind of uh, transcend that great word uh, to, to kind of uh, see that both people are human. Uh, and, and both people in the room have to try to do that for this to work, it seems to me. And again, there are formats that allow both to be sort of on that equal plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah have a, a track to run on so we don't derail. <laughs> I would be willing to stay for a few more minutes if the rest of you are. Sure. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's do one more question. Um, a video went viral this week of a Michigan State Senator, Mallory McMorrow, passionately and angrily confronting another Senator who had accused her of being a groomer of children because of her defense of LGBT children and other things like wanting white children to feel guilty about slavery. This speech was viewed by many as a template for Democrats to stand up with a passion for their values. This is a striking contrast to the tenor of the recommendations today. Democrats have been accused of underselling their passions, uh, e.g., when they go low, we go high. I'm wondering how to square these two approaches to trying to change the world. Well, in a sense, I think maybe that's what I've been pushing with, you know, here with Alice that um, that I would like to I would like to hear her speak up for when when Bobby says something that she really thinks is wrong to not be silent about it. I guess one of the problems I have is that I don't so much think about one side being totally right and totally wrong. I, I would be a terrible debater um, be, because, you know, I, I would sort of validate the other side's perspective and then add, but what about this? <laughs> um, Even when he said that there were 150 years of developmental psychology that said, you know, children that age can't know anything about gender identity. Well, that was at the end and I, that we were closing up and I said, that's for a future conversation. <laughs> but I mean, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, and I think the question is, um, uh, exhibits uh, the way we are trained to think and that is dualistically. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how, how do we change the world it is, as though we're going to change the world to what we know is to be right. And I think our you know, waging dialogue is transcending dualism uh, and hovering above it and saying, yeah. we're not gonna live in that place of this right, this wrong. Yeah, short of an imminent threat, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I have a, I just have a different sense about where I would love to see this go. Can't we say no? That's not right. I'm I've been trained as a mental health professional. That's not right. I want you to listen to me. Okay, so let, let's. How about you do the next one, and we'll find you a partner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. Okay, I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. Okay, that's Bobby, go find your partner. That that would. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm thinking about this because I'm trying to imagine yeah. myself doing that. I'm not yeah. saying I could do it better than you. I definitely don't think I could. And we have different styles. That's the other yeah. thing, exciting thing about this is that I, you know, what I do is is what I do because of who I am. Um, but it would be very exciting to have you know other people do their own version. I volunteer. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and. All right. and you know, you could come from the viewpoint, Sue, that uh, you have 150 years of information that tells you something different. So that's why you don't agree. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I would be attacking the person, you exactly. know? Exactly. Right. It's just you have a different yeah. opinion I based on different information. And mm -hmm. so much of it has to do with the, the energy 
with which you convey your your perspective, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, mm -hmm. you know, the charge. What kind mm -hmm. of charge does it have, right? Mm -hmm. Is it accusatory, for example? Right. That's, that's Am I trying to know. nail this person? That's right. I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna degrade you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna sock it to them. <laughs> that's why we need ground rules too. That's right. and explicit. <laughs> I want to hear your ground rules before I do this, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, I'll be glad to send you them. We can set up some ground rules, but but like in psychoanalysis, the fundamental rule is the fundamental rule, but the whole process is about looking at what gets in the way of being able to follow it. You know, saying what comes to mind without censoring. So I can see setting up rules, but also looking at how two people, you know, respond to that, you know, framework. Yeah, very variation. Yeah. yeah. And I see in the chat, another one of our group members, Alex, commenting on Claire's question that it would be the the difference is communication um alice to bobby versus this viral video of uh, mcmorrow was oratory she you know she was elaborating or defending herself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so good insight alex <laughs> Alrighty, um, I guess we will wrap it there. Um, and thank you all so much for doing this. And thank you, thank you to our uh, attendees for uh, hanging out. And thank you to Matt uh, too. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Oh, Setting it up. It, okay. it all worked. The um, tech worked. Yes. And, and more importantly, Bobby's not here, but thank you, Bobby. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Bobby. Bobby. Glad you and we'll figure out where we want to go with this next, and maybe we can have him uh, stop by next time. Could <laughs> <laughs> be interesting. <laughs> um. All Thank right. You, Thank you all so Thank much. You. Bye, Bye. Bye. Much appreciation. Yes.